It's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting. Welcome to It's So Interesting, where people talk about their work and life experience. I am George Spitzer. I have with me today Frank Goss of Sullivan and Goss, an American gallery in Santa Barbara, California. Frank is a very modest guy, but I'm going to force him to t rag a little bit about the success of his gallery vis-a-vis -vis all the other galleries in the United States. Please explain to me and everyone else the differentiation and your focus. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a special pleasure to be here on this day with you. The focus of the gallery, it is called Sullivan Goss and American Gallery. We would be the only American gallery west of Santa Fe. We do that partially to differentiate ourselves and partially we think that's one of the markets that is underrepresented on the West Coast, and so we enjoy that unique position. Unlike a lot of galleries who just take a pile of paintings in by an artist on the first of the month, and at the end of the month they take the unsold ones and give them back to them, and then take the next artist in the following month, we actually own thousands of works of art here. Uh, so people could come in today and they could buy John Singer Sargent, they could buy Colin Campbell Cooper, they could buy any of a number of the great American artists. Uh, there's a child ha Hassam here on, on the wall right now. We have a M William Merritt Chase coming up. And just to be able to show those that level of art and those kinds of artists is an absolute uh, privilege. We also show a dozen living artists, and some galleries, as I said, they escort the artist in at the beginning of the first day of the month and out at the last day of the month. We represent those artists. Most of them we've represented more than five years, and some of them more than 15 years. We show their work periodically, and the period is about 24 to 30 months, and so we, we have an exhibit for them as, as they are completing the next round of work that they do. So w there's just nothing at all common about what it is we do. Um, when you compare us to all of the galleries on the West Coast, I would be relatively sure that we sell more paintings than any art gallery on the West Coast. How I think that is we sell between 30 and 40 paintings a month, which is more than one a day. And I don't know that there are very many galleries that do that. That's a little misleading because you'd think there were millions and millions and millions of dollars. And there certainly are millions of dollars that go through here. But oftentimes we're, we're, we're showing an artist in some ways whose, whose work is very inexpensive, maybe work that might be thought of as unrehearsed and not of a vintage nature. It's a, it's a pleasure to represent those artists. Um, we have done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of exhibits this year. In fact, you and I are recording this in May. That is the month of our 30th anniversary. And so we are pleased to be here in Santa Barbara. We ha had a wonderful bit of support from the citizens of Santa Barbara. And I would say a little more than 50% of our sales are people who live and work in the greater Santa Barbara area, certainly Montecito, Santa Barbara, and Goleta would be the bulk of our our clients. But there are lots of clients that don't live in the West Coast and do business with us because we're an American gallery. And um, so there are those clients who are across the United States. And I would bet we have 20 or 30 regular clients who are international, not at all uh, thought of as Americans with whom we do business. So that's the general uh, distinction between Sullivan Goss and American Gallery and all of the other galleries on the West Coast. Touch a little bit about the East Coast. Are there any galleries out there specializing, and usually East Coast means New York and Boston. Are there any galleries out there that specialize in just American artists? And there are, are, yes. There are. Yeah, there are lots of them. Mm -hmm. I would guess across the nation there are maybe 10 or 12. Uh, the bulk of them, as you said, uh, being in New York. Uh, one or two in Boston, one in Atlanta, two in Santa Fe, one in, in uh, Chicago, and that's about the lot of it. And they're all little bit like us in that they own paintings. They're not just taking the paintings in the first of the month and handing the unsold ones off at the end of the month. These are, are galleries that in some cases have more, much more inventory than we have. That's a special sort of strain and stress on, on galleries because it means if somebody walks in with a painting tomorrow, uh, let's say an Ed, Edward Potast, um, one of the greatest American Impressionists, we have to be ready, ready to write a check. And they, so they walk out, with, they walk in with a painting and out with a check. And as you might guess, that's not going to happen in most galleries in the United, most galleries in the world. 
Uh, so it does put us in a somewhat unique position. But it also means that we get these great vintage American pieces. As a consequence, there's not a whole lot of competition on this coast, except, so if you want to buy a, let's say a child has some, you can either look at the ones we have here, or you could get in a jet and go to New York. And, and probably in New York, any one visit through New York, you might be able to find 10 pieces. And so you, it, it's relatively easy to um, survey all of the pot S that are available in America. And it all forces us all to be kind of competitive because we, we don't want to have our piece that's equivalent to a piece in New York to be 20% more. Everybody's, the Internet's ubiquitous, and um, <laughs> everybody's capable of making a phone call or an email. And the Internet does level the playing field. It, it totally levels in a, in a really good way. Uh, it means that in the old days there might have been some uh, provincialization where, where somebody would take a painting in, let's say, in uh, Bethesda and offer it for sale at twice its value. And if there wasn't an Internet and, and it wasn't easy to communicate with everybody, that might sell at twice its value. People don't do that today. It, it, the, there's always the temptation to make an extra buck. But really what we are seeing is a kind of unitization of pricing across the United States, as it, certainly as it has to do with the great artists of America. Before I go further in our conversation, just give us a, a small list of each of both the artists that have passed on, you know, not so much by, dedicate, by de decade, but also living, as you say. And I have some more questions after that, but just to give our listeners a better sure. idea. Well, I would think that in the gallery, early American paintings are very stiff and very, because people had to hold still for the whole sitting, oftentimes they would make a chair with a little head post that would keep the model from moving their head during the sitting. And the sitting might be four or five sittings, let's say five or six hours of sitting. Well, you can't hold a smile in that circumstance, so everybody looks kind of dour and uh, unhappy and, and definitely out of sorts. And so those early American paintings, they don't show up on this coast very much, largely because the West Coasters want something fresher, brighter, more full of life. Absolutely, they want to see a smile on the, on the uh, model's face. And we want to see a beautiful young woman in however she is posing in her beauty, the East Coasters might say, oh, you know, she's a social matron, so we want to make her look socially acceptable, and we want a certain kind of ermine on her, we want a certain kind of dress and coat on her, we want the background to look like a palatial mansion. West Coast, they don't care. They would like a beautiful woman, young or old, to, to be in the sort of natural light and in a natural and relaxed state. So we have some of those paintings. By golly, do they seem grumpy. Um, mm -hmm. But but we also have, uh, to kind of offset that, we have the new work of uh, American artists. And that work across the United States is, in general, more positive than, than uh, work of, uh, well, certainly work of the Great Depression. I mean, you would expect it to be more positive. But there's also a kind of mindset that Californians have where they want the subject matter and the models and the uh, sort of inferences that are made to be reflective of California. They're, they're, we are Californians here, and so people come in from, let's say, Montecito to look at a painting, or Goleta, and if they see that studied, academic, forced issue, whether it's a landscape or an architectural uh, rendering or, or a human being, they're really not that interested in, even if it's part of the school in which the artist works. They want to see that there's a sense that Californians are self-made, and they like to see that. They like to see that the subject matter is driving, not driven. They like to see that, the, in the case of a landscape, let's say, there are what are called closed and open landscapes. A closed landscape would be, let's say, looking into a forest path with the forest on either side of the path and an invitation to go down the path. In the art world, that's called a closed landscape because there's an implication that the artist wants you to enter mentally that path and walk into the painting. West Coasters aren't very interested in that kind of painting. They want the open landscape that implies that the earth goes on forever, that there is sunshine not only in this part of the world, but it, it encompasses the globe. They want that, and it can be a happy or sad painting. Uh, it, they just want that sense that that there's room to make yourself, there's room to participate in the painting, and the, there's room to expand 
in a, in a, at the invitation of the artist. So effectively, you don't really do much Hudson River. Uh, it's interesting that you would pick uh, Hudson River. I, I happen to have a weakness for Hudson River. I have a weakness for nocturnes. I have a weakness for paintings that are referred to as tonal. And in, in, the, in the lot of things, the Hudson River, the tonal paintings are by the young collectors. These would be collectors under, certainly collectors under 40, but maybe even collectors under 45. They refer to those in a group. They call them old brown paintings. And, like, and like white, dead, dead white men. Yeah. Exactly. And there's sort of like you can say, well, this is the Hudson River and this is the setting sun and it's beautifully reflected off the Catskills. And they go, oh, God, what do you have that's a little more less constricted and less constructed and less sort of made? And, and we, we like plain air paintings where the, the sunlight is the natural sunlight. So that sounds like Ray Strong. Uh, Ray Strong was always sharing in that mythology. Ray was personally a fairly upbeat and positive and optimistic person. And when you look at his paintings, you look at these rolling hills, and the implication is that whether it's fall or spring, those rolling hills go on forever. And that this is, you're, you're seeing a sort of outtake from a grand picture where the Hudson River guys, the, the valley, you're looking down the valley. There's no world outside the valley. It's, you're invited to look at the valley where Ray maybe is more of a transcendentalist than most. Uh, the Hudson River people were often congregational people and largely influenced by their Puritan upbringing, like, let me show you God. Not not your God, God. And and obviously that's the definition of the artist saying that Ray would um, have think, thought of as a, a, a bowl of fruit as being part of God and he would have thought of a blowing leaf as being part of God and certainly he would have thought of the rolling hills. And I don't think he would have used a capital G on that on that word. As Lockwood in the forest, both day and night. He is, and, and that's a really good and in, interesting question that you've asked because Lockwood was the sort of son of, of Hudson River uh, painters. He, his uncle, in some kind of weird marriage blood arrangement, I've never quite figured it out, his uncle was the great Frederick Church, the, maybe the second most important Hudson River painter of all time, and one that was an unbelievably interested in showing the magnificence of nature. His young acolyte and supposedly nephew uh, was Lockwood de Forest, and Lockwood was raised in Manhattan. And his, to give you a sense of his uh, lineage, his dad was a lawyer, and his brothers, one was the president of the Met, the Petro Metropolitan Museum, the other brother was president of the Atchison, and Topeka and Santa Fe. And so they're a very powerful family in practice of law, and they become officers in the most, some of the most important corporations and art institutes in America. And they have this sort of black sheep of a son, Lockwood, who is, is invited to go to Yale and doesn't want to go to Yale. There's rumor is that he tried it out for about six months and said, that's not what I want to do. I, mean, I want to be an artist. This was 100 years ago, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. It would have been in 18, well, somewhere way before 1870. So anyway, he then studies and has a career and is exceedingly successful in, his, in the showing of his work and in his import duty. He would have been partners with Louis Comfort Tiffany in, in the company that we today know as Tiffany's. They had a marvelous import business, and that's where DeForest sort of started making his own fortune. But he was also painting as he traveled in the East and in Persia and Afghanistan. And had, he had a studio where he taught, where carvers were taught to carve in Pakistan. Um, and when we think about those places today, they're kind of all in turmoil. But in his period, they were largely owned, kind of controlled by the, the British. So he goes there and he paints all those places. You would think if you went to, let's say, the Nile, that you would head first to Luxor and maybe second to Aswan to see the great sculptures and the great structures in those areas. Instead of going to those places, he goes to spots along the Nile that nobody's ever heard of, and he paints the beautiful scapes. And again, an implication that the scape goes on forever, but he picks one little bit of sand and, and uh, growing plants and, uh, and an embankment and the sun, uh, sunshine or sunset. And he loved to, to paint those things. Little known about him is that as he's becoming more and more successful, he's losing his hearing. And he comes west to Santa Barbara in 1902, and he sets up kind of winters here. And he winters here pretty much the rest of his life. And winters, as you know, he's a, he's a Manhattanite. Winters are the one time of year when artists need to be in New York with their galleries. And he's having shows every winter, and he doesn't want to be there. And uh, I was always just puzzled by that, and then recently uh, learned that he was going deaf. 
deaf is its own sort of isolation. Deaf people, uh, you will raise your voice to talk to them for a while, and then you get tired of that. And then they get tired of trying, struggling to hear you. So pretty soon communication ceases. And that's absolutely what happened to DeForest. So he comes here, and he learns to paint, and he doesn't paint really with anybody. He's a solo guy. He gets on his horse and he rides to the Santa Inez or he rides down to the beach and, and he paints and he paints day and night. Uh, that we know of, there are almost 400 nocturnes that DeForest executed in his lifetime. He paints the first one in 1878 and he continues to paint every full moon through, I think, 27. And in 27, he's 70 some years old and he's still getting on his horse and riding to the beach in the dark of night, painting the moon. It, it, I wish I had the opportunity to interview him as as, as you would have, I'm certainly certain done. I mean, that curiosity of yours is, would have been, oh, God, let me interview the guy who's deaf and, and rides a horse at night, even though the struggle would have been to have him, him interviewed, certainly orally, it would have been difficult. His, Calif his paintings of California are more important to Californians than they are to New Yorkers. His paintings of New York are very important to New York, and like he painted the Niagara and he painted all those cities up and down from Bar Harbor on down to Boston and was often there again at night. But when you go out at night to paint, nobody goes with you. And so you don't have to worry about the communication thing. And when you see these paintings of the lonely moon setting over the ocean or rising, if you're on the East Coast, I have to wonder if those aren't self-portraits, that the light shining in the darkness is Lockwood DeForest speaking to us. You know, it's a self-portrait. So anyway, that's the Lockwood DeForest story. You have curators. Who are, we do. You yourself are an expert in quite a few things, as you have just indicated, but you also have curators who are also experts. We do. do you, all your curators generally trained by you, or are they trained professionally elsewhere, and do they have specialties? They, they all come here with a certain expertise. Most of them have studied in colleges or universities as art historians or art history writers. When they come here, they get more instruction in that. All of our curators write, all of our curators curate, all of our curators are familiar in depth with their specialty. We have Nathan Vonk, whom you know, who is our uh, sculpture curator. And so if a, piece is, if a sculptor calls here and wants to know how to show at Sullivan Goss, we just refer him to Nathan. If they're a living artist, we would refer them to Susan Bush, who is a wonderful curator of contemporary art and knows kind of, there's a special kind of person who's going to be able to work with artists. Uh, art, as you might imagine, I would say that most good art comes from a fairly deep well in the artist. And so when you are looking at it on behalf of the gallery, they see you looking at them and they are anxious that you like them, that you like their work. So to, to work with that sort of set of circumstances at the start is fairly difficult because we probably get five or six artists a day that either send us by email their images or send a letter or, or a package with their um, material in it, or they, they come in, they walk in and say, I've got my stuff out in the car, you want to see it? That marks them as terribly amateurish. No artist should ever be schlepping their stuff into a gallery because the first person through the door is going to go, well, what are those paintings the guy's bringing in? And not look at the art on the wall. And we are challenge, cha the art, we, we champion the work on the wall. We don't champion the guy walking in with stuff out of his trunk. So Susan's very good at having the patience to work with them and having that sort of lifetime goal that she would be the one when the next Georgia O'Keeffe um, walks in and, and maybe they walk in with their own art under their arm to not just throw them out and say, you know, learn some manners and learn protocol and galleries and get out of here. She would never do that. And she's much more polite than that. I would do that. And so she's always looking because that person walking in and not knowing how the art gallery works might in fact be the next Georgia O'Keeffe. So she's always looking for that uh, great next artist. Then our third and final, then the longest serving staff member is uh, Jeremy Tesmer. And Jeremy is generally thought as the curator of vintage, the work that is by artists who are no longer with us. And that way I can assist each of them with what they're doing. And I'm not responsible for any of that. So it, it, uh, people, dead artists go to Jeremy, living artists go to Susan, living sculptors, dead sculptors go to <laughs> Nathan. And it makes the division of labor here, we don't cross each other's paths very often because I, I, if I'm looking at sculptor, I say, you know, very quickly, you need to talk to Nathan Vonk about this. If it's a living artist, Susan Bush, and if it's 
uh, a thing of days gone by, uh, Jeremy. And as I said, I work with all those uh, people and to make sure that there's cohesion in what we show because we have seven galleries here. That would be seven separate rooms where we have things. And it's important that when you walk in, if you are a visitor to the gallery, you get a sense of what we're about and not one particular strain or, or to be showing, let's say, some variant. And we do show variants from time to time. We, we don't want people leaving saying, oh, you know, they only show the work of women artists. That would be a, a problem for us to have that happen. So we are always trying to make sure that there's a sense of balance between all those curational activities. When you work with your curators, who you've worked with for many, many years, yes. and sometimes decades, yeah. you get to develop a relationship, yes. a one of trust. Mm -hmm. The fact remains that it's a tendency of most business managers and gallery managers to be micromanagers. Are you a micromanager? I'm sure there are people who would say that. <laughs> but in general, I don't like detail. I don't like the nits and grits. I like the bigger picture. So my effort is to work with each of them on what we ought to be thinking about overall and listening to them when they have suggestions of what we ought to add to overall. And we run like a real corporation. You know, We have an annual meeting. We set our goals for the year. And the goals have to do with who we're going to show, when we're going to show them, how many pieces by those artists we're going to show, what the values are, because we want to be able, we want the, let's say the young collectors just starting out to be able to come and find something that's on the wall that they absolutely are knocked out by. That's two thousand dollars and not fifty thousand dollars. But we also want the, the the sophisticated, thoroughly developed collector to come in here and walk out with a, let's say, an Andrew Wyeth. And you were here to see we had an Andrew Wyeth show a little while back that had I don't know twenty Andrew Wyeths in it. And, you know, there's not an Andrew Wyeth available for under 200000 So we want people to have all of those opportunities. But it's much deeper than that. We also, I mean, we're merchants. And so we're trying to merchandise always something that's fairly rough to merchandise, which means that you don't want all the paintings to be blue. You don't all, want all the paintings to be closed landscapes or open landscapes. You don't want all the artists to be males and no females. You You don't want to somehow ignore the black community, the brown community, the gay community, the women community. I mean, those are all parts of our culture, and we want all those people to feel free to come in here and find things that reflect them. In terms of trust of your curators, do you send them out to the field when you hear a lead? Or, I mean, you can't be everywhere, but you have to send them out, I believe, with a checkbook. Um, in general, if a, ch if a check is going to be written, I'm going to be involved in it, maybe by phone or by email or by... Uh, you know, Skype or something, mm -hmm. because the ultimate commitment in dollars are from me, and ultimately the risk is my risk. So they will all, very often go into the field. Susan is traveling alone in about in in June to Aspen, where she will represent the company with forty paintings that she will hang. And you know, it's, this is a modern woman. She's not afraid to schlep forty paintings to Aspen. She's not afraid to hang forty paintings. She's not, I mean, this is a day and night job, so she'll finish hanging the show on a Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday night. She's got to be in a dress and heels and ready to show the art. She's the only one there. She's got to be able to be nice to people and, um, and, and go after those that look like they really are interested in a painting and sell them. And that might, that'll go on for her for six days, six days of uh, eight, nine, ten hour days. And that's, that's part of a part of our life. Jeremy very often goes and makes field visits on his own. Nathan and I went back to a good cooperative thing. We went back to Manalapan, New York, and Manhattan, where we bought a state of a little more than 100 paintings by an artist whose name is Leon Dabo, who's a very important American artist, whose stuff had somehow escaped the savagery of, of earlier art dealers. So the estate stayed together. His medals that he won in World War I were there. His correspondence was there. All the catalogs from his shows were there. The flag that he was buried in as a, <laughs> as a national hero was there. It's like Tutankhamun's tomb. It absolutely is like that. So we did that together. And once we had, I don't know, maybe all together with drawings and everything or a couple, 300 pieces. Then Nathan drove it across the country all by himself. So, yes, I mean, here's millions of dollars in the back of a truck. And our insurance is very limited, so he can't let that out of his sight. So at night, he has to be in a motel, and he has to back the truck up to the window and door and he has to leave the window open all night long so you can see the truck if the truck is out of his line of sight our insurance doesn't cover it so it, it's uh it's an interesting business it's got all these little side lights and the people who work here are completely trusted you are sitting in a room with you know, maybe a million dollars worth of art our people are fully trained in that world 
it's easy to put your foot through, you know, the painting sitting on the floor and put your foot through it. They've been around these paintings for long enough that they know how not to have that happen. And they are completely responsible and all, in all ways, honest and sensitive and bright. They're all very bright and they're all, they take their job seriously. They carry the name art dealer as a sort of proud thing. Well, so effectively, here at you and your gallery, a lot of it's got to do with reputation. Yes. You've developed it over the decades. Absolutely. Your curators are part of that reputation. Can they get better? Uh, all of us can, and, and me included. And part of how I get better is listening to them. You know, they'll I mean, they'll walk into, we, we meet like any good corporation once a week uh, for a couple of hours, and we talk about what's going to happen during the week and what our goals are and who we're going to call and what we're going to exhibit and how we're going to do that and which artists we're going to interview. And that's the sort of weekly meeting. We kind of march forth from that as a united group. But when I go to those meetings, and every meeting, somebody will come forward with an idea that's out of left field. So my job is to not go, no, that's not a good idea. Or, you know, I haven't been thinking that way. Or, But to listen to that. And, and every meeting, somebody brings up some topic that is coming from elsewhere. And they all, we all go, we all travel in the art world. So there are exhibits in Los Angeles. There's an exhibit coming up of student work at UCSB. There's an exhibit at Westmont coming up. There's the Oak Group showing. There are all these shows that we try to get to so that we know what's being produced amongst the younger artists of, of America. Susan travels all over. She goes up to San Francisco, to New York. She went down to the Laguna Beach Art School not too long ago, and we found a good artist there. So that part of, of the business is shared, and they are, I think, largely because they're younger. They're smarter, and they're more adventuresome than I am. You know, age sort of stiffens us, and we get less pliable as we get older and what's nice about these I, I think Nathan and Jeremy are 36 or so 37 that's a very young art dealer so they're always coming up with ideas uh, today Jeremy was talking about a computer sort of use of an existing computer company who sort of advertises in the world of decorators and how we might participate in that I you know, it's an idea that I hadn't thought of and Nathan was asking about we lost power here a week ago. Well, actually, you and I were scheduled to have something going on, and, and this, uh, like all that power outage meant that all my appointments were dominoed in Cascade uh, to move a date or two. Nathan was talking about moving our server to an off-site server because when the power goes out here, our server's here, and it means that we can't get into our own database at that <laughs> point. Uh, so they're, they're bright guys and gals, and they're very much... I mean, clearly you can see when you listen to them and hear them daily, that they're the next generation. Apropos that thought, I want to explore a little bit about how you became a gallery owner, because there's no school for gallery owners. There's no degree in gallery owners, successful ones. Are you effectively training your three main curators to be the next generation oh, running clearly this Clearly, they're going to, they will run galleries. I hope it's this one. Mm -hmm. That requires a certain risk on their part and a certain mm -hmm. risk on my part, and we're mm -hmm. kind of talking about that now. Mm -hmm. I would love it if they would be the next set of owners in the gallery. I know that they, even should they end up elsewhere, they will stay. I mean, we've had lots of sort of graduates of the School of Sullivan Goss over the years. They all leave here and they're all opening their own galleries. I mean, there are probably a dozen gallery owners around the United States, including, I think, South Carolina, but it might be North Carolina, uh, Santa Fe, Taos, Los Angeles, San Diego. Uh, San Francisco. I mean, they, they just they end up running their own galleries or working at another gallery. The Sullivan and Goss University. There you are. And that that's the school. My, now, how I got into the business was I went the, the a very most circuitous way. I married a woman who had been a gallery employee and who had a degree in art history from UCLA. And so I got in it as a, I was the husband of the owner of the gallery for more than 10 years and I, I was an engineer during those years, and I sold my engineering firm about 18 years ago, and I joined her. And so I, I was the freeloading spouse for a long time. She is now retired for health reasons, and uh, she's left this with me, and, and I tried to take good care of it on her behalf. You have many interests, and have to have that because of the artists and the nature of your business. You also run a restaurant right in the middle of the gallery. 
which is also unusual. The museums have, you know, restaurants and right. all this. Right, exactly. But this is no museum. This is an active art right. gallery. And I've not been to many active art galleries with a really good restaurant. Right in the middle. Thank you, thank you. Outdoors and all yeah. that sort of yeah. stuff. Is it worth your trouble? Because it's very labor-intensive. <laughs> it is unbelievably labor-intensive. And we're only open for one meal, lunch. It's sort of hard to make a go of it if you're only open for one meal. We have a really good manager, a woman named Lisa Neustadt, whom you know, and she has been here, I think, 15 years. It's always been a struggle to make a buck or lose a buck. No matter what it is, it's a struggle. And last year, she brought home the most successful year in the history of the cafe. It was so stunningly wonderful that we were all kind of unprepared for it at the time. It meant we had to pay taxes where we had never paid taxes for. But by God, that's the best moment to pay taxes is on a profit. The mixture of art and food is really interesting food. I mean, they're both visual, they're, they're both tactile, they're both art forms, and our sort of enjoyment of that. And it, they're, they are a very different one from the other, as, as you might well expect. If I buy a painting, we, we keep, as I mentioned, thousands of pieces of art here. Average life here is about five years for a painting. And so I buy it on Monday of, of 2000. I, I may not sell that for five, six, seven years. The average life of a piece here is five years. So I don't know whether I did a good job. You know, I, I just, I have no idea whether I was successful in the purchase of that until ultimately we sell that. The complete opposite is true of the, uh, of the restaurant. If you make a crummy grilled cheese sandwich, <laughs> you hear about it within a couple of minutes. Not, and, and because everybody knows me, all the, all the people who dine here know me. Um, they, they're saying, well, Frank, you really should look into the grilled cheese. <laughs> There's something wrong with the grilled cheese. And uh, so, yes, there. So you're dealing with Andrew Wyeth for one minute, then you're dealing with grilled cheese, <laughs> and then you're dealing with a waitress and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And you know, yeah. the, the, of, of the high forms of art, Andrew Wyeth would be one of the highest, but right up there is grilled, a good grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> also, the people aspect of this. Yeah. The, does this help build your community of collectors? Well, it was how we sort of structured it to the start. You have to go through the gallery to get to the cafe. Built our menu so that people above 50 who were interested in what they ate, so that we're not serving uh, sort of the things that aren't good for you. We're serving really good things for you. We know every farmer, every rancher, every shepherd, every fisherman. We know every single one of them, and we know what they're feeding their flock or their um, if it's chickens, what they're feeding, or chickens or turkey, or what they're putting into the field in the way of inorganic materials for vegetables. And we don't serve inorganic. We don't, everything we serve here is organic. Now, those cost more, right? I mean, a, an organic head of lettuce costs more than a head of lettuce raised in Mexico. As a consequence, our food is a little more expensive. Maybe not a lot, but maybe 20% more expensive than uh, the next door neighbor. So people who come in here are a little better off. I mean, it's not unusual to see half the judges in town dining in the back, or the district attorney, or uh, the mayor, or, or, or people of a lot of real estate transactions happen here. And, and we often get called to the table for a bottle of champagne to, to toast the closure of a transaction. As a consequence, we, we, the clientele here is educated and moneyed. And that's not an accident. That's on purpose. So those, let's say, 100 people a day that dine in a cafe, they're walking through our gallery, and they're capable of making the purchases. There, there, there are people who have enough money that, in their discretionary accounts that they can buy a painting or buy a drawing. You hit a word I wanted to ask you about, discretionary, because um, all art collecting is discretionary. You don't have to buy a painting. But there is a school of people who buy paintings as an investment. You know, People have stocks, bonds, real estate, gold, silver, and paintings. Which category, other than your own prejudice, is good? I try really hard to watch the visitors to the gallery. And the guy that's just interested in a good investment, I'm a little less interested in selling him something because essentially I just, he's, he's going to want the best, lowest price he can find, and, and he's going to negotiate me down to where I'm really not pleased with the transaction. And I might still do the transaction because we ultimately have to take in a certain number of dollars every day, and that's part of life. But clients who are passionate... Maybe my favorite kind of buyer is, let's say, the carpenter who comes in in his work clothes. So maybe you don't want to stand downwind from him because he's worked a hard day in the, in the sun. And he finds a drawing that he really likes. And he brings it up 
in his hands that are caked and sort of worked in grime. Fingernails aren't the cleanest you've ever seen. And he lays that like he was laying a baby child on the counter. And he says, I'd, I'd like to buy this, but it's too expensive for me. I'd like to make payments. Can you do that? And we're happy to do that. And that's maybe the collector that I, I'm most intrigued by because they're taking it from the milk money and they're sacrificing some part. They're not going to go to movies for uh, you know three months. That's somebody who's so in love with this piece of art. And it's never a $50,000 thing or a $100,000 thing. Those guys don't make time payments. It's the guy with a two and $3,000 painting. And he brings it in and he, as I said, he obviously thinks of it as a treasury. He holds it like you hold a baby. And he brings it to, to us and he says, you know, I just love this. I, I really can't live without this. So when you say it's not mandatory, it is not mandatory, you're correct. But there are some folks for whom avoiding it is, is almost a criminal thing. And they really want the thing enough to make real changes in their lives in order to afford it. There are also those collectors who are sufficiently well off that they can kind of buy what they want to buy. There's a, a, a joie de vivre that you see in them when they're walking through the gallery. They stop, they linger at the paintings that are favorites of theirs. We, we kind of are obviously sort of moneyed, and we can walk up to them and say, you know, I, I see you like that painting. Tell me what it is that intrigues you about that painting. And we're genuinely interested in the response because we're art dealers. And when they say, well, you know, I like things from the 30s, we say, ah, so happens we've got some other things from the 30s. Out, out in the back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when we say to them, so tell us what's in, in your collection, what's at home in your collection, and they start talking to us about paintings that we know, we, we are aware that they are sophisticated enough that, that we don't have to direct them as to how to see the painting. There are other people who look at things and they go, wow, you know, abstract artists can't get that. Well, it's an invitation to us as art dealers to help them make the transition into uh, abstract art. So it's a, it's a really fun project. You have all kinds of customers, as you indicated. Is there an engine that pulls the gallery? Certainly the economy, the general economy. We've only been deathly quiet twice. One was following 9-11. Nobody was in the gallery for three months. We just didn't have anybody in here. I mean, we didn't have anybody in here. I don't mean a few people came in. Nobody came in. We were all frightened. We didn't know what had happened. Yeah, you had to pay the bills, the heating. Well, the no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, the clients were frightened because oh. we didn't know. Are we at war? Uh, we, we just lost, you know, six hundred people. We lost two of the biggest buildings in America. What has happened to our world? And they're frightened. And they just don't buy paintings when they're frightened. Then the recession of '08 that manifested itself in a pretty sour economy in '09. It was very evident. Now people came in. But I would threaten always to put speed bumps in the route into the cafe because they would come in with their eyes straight forward. They wouldn't look right. They wouldn't look left. Didn't make any difference what we put on the walls. They weren't looking. Move quickly into the cafe and sit down and have their lunch and then move quickly out. And they just, again, they were frightened. People that, no matter what they were worth, if they were worth $100,000 uh, in 07, they were worth 70 or 65 two years later. If they were worth $3 billion, they were worth $2 billion. Nobody suffers that one-third loss and doesn't go, wow, is that the start of it? Is that the end of it? Are we going to have another bad year this year? And if I was worth $3 million on, on a year ago and now I'm worth $2 million, what's next year? Am I going to be $1 million? Am I going to have anything left? And people were too frightened to actually look at art. Look so those are the two times. In, invest in art. Yeah. And that's when you go out and buy a painting. Yeah. You know, so. That's right. Uh, it's just like the stock market then. Yeah. yeah. So... The next downturn, come in here. You know, we've we've. This is our, our going into our thirtieth year. What happens is, I'm sure, happens to you and sort of all of us that have a, a kind of ability to plan our lives. And not everybody can do that. You know, there are, there are lives that are much more urgent than that. We stop spending. We stop all spending. Our dealers never ever buy a car on time, ever. They when they get that big commission check comes in, they have cash and they go buy the car with cash. Because you don't know if you can make a monthly payment a year from now. You it's just not, don't know. There's no salary job. No. Uh, yeah. and, and so I think all of us are very, very careful. And careful planning has gotten us through this. Uh, we have only had one losing year. It was in the year of 2009. We lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Had we not had it in the bank, we would have closed. Sad as that might be, it certainly could have happened. I mean, think of all the businesses that did close. When we went started going into the recession and... 07, I sort of did a tabulation of what I thought the art dealer world was like. 
And I thought, well, we're going to probably lose 10, maybe 20%. Actually, we lost 50%. I mean, half of the art galleries that were in business in 07 are not in business today. Yeah, pretty that's, rough. that's sober. Pretty rough time, yeah. 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 Now, you but as to your point of how art is not mandatory, you don't need art in the way that we need food and shelter. But your soul needs it. So. I, I actually think for those people like me, you need it just like you need food and shelter. We take, I don't know, probably two paintings home a year. Mm-hmm. And we thoroughly enjoy them. We get a lot out of them. The thought of living in my house without art, first of all, it's kind of crummy old uh, claptrap of a house. And then I have to look at the walls. And it's like, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> um, So I'm, I'm much happier to have artwork. It's the same with me. Jane and I, when we buy paintings, we don't even think about reselling them. Yeah. We just want to enjoy them yeah. while we're here. I know. That's, that's, see, that to me is the real, that's that joie de vie that I was telling you about, that people who love them for what they are, the, the investment issue, the, like, does it match the couch? They're not interested in any of that stuff. They just like the painting. It's its own excuse. Now, I wanted to ask you, now that you've been in business for 30 years mm-hmm. doing this, that means you must no longer be very young, so mm-hmm. other than in thought. Yeah. But the fact remains, you didn't plan on being in this business. You no, kinda, no, you, you I know, As an engineer, you fell into it. And you yeah. go from engineering into art, into mm-hmm. business management, mm-hmm. restauranting. Yeah. What next? Is there going to be what next? I don't know. I don't have any more careers in me. I started life as a teacher, and I taught for seven years at a high school, and the corresponding seven years I taught at a junior college, and then I taught a couple of years at a university. And then I went into engineering and did that for a little shy of 20 years. And I am now in my final career and want very much to stay in the, I love this career. I get up, we live in the mountains behind the uh, city of Santa Barbara. It takes me 15 minutes to get to work. As I'm coming down the hill, I'm going, wow, I really got a lot of stuff to do today. I'm really looking forward to getting in there. And by the time I'm here, I'm just like, okay, ready to go, ready to go. It's, that was that great, uh, fired up, ready to go. Mm-hmm. Fired up, ready to go, that's me. By the end of the day, I'm worn out because I'm old. And I'm tired and my back is sore. And it's like, you know, I really want to get home. I, my home is very peaceful. We live in such a rural area. The big exciting thing for a day is to have four or five cars go by. Boring days are two cars go by. <laughs> So you're there very rarely, rarely taking a day off. Uh, well, I work seven days. Yeah. And all real art dealers, they'll tell you. They, they work in a gallery maybe five days or six days. Yeah, but you're, you're but all, oh, no, no, no. When yeah. I'm at home, I'm sitting at a computer writing the history of the artists that I like and admire and um, whose history hasn't been written. We're working on a book on Ray Strong. You mentioned Ray Strong earlier. Yeah. We're working on a book on Ray Strong. And I have lots of help. Mm-hmm. I have seven authors working. You're a publisher. You know these things. Mm-hmm. We have set ourselves a schedule and everybody should have drafts to me in October and we rewrite uh, we'll be in before the end of the year we'll set the type as type is set today of course on a computer and uh, we'll go to press I'm looking forward to it so you also in addition to the restaurant the gallery uh, education and university yeah. you also publish books we do we, we probably have done 20 books uh-huh. it's not and a, that supports the business I it mean, does I, it does they're all about artists being a publisher yeah. I can't imagine you making money at it uh, I, I, I'm just trying to control the losses on that side of the house <laughs> but it, as you know it's uh, the, the sort of secret that only publishers know and only publishers will ever reveal is that you might tell me something is good but until it's in print it's not true and it's really true. People like, look at a book and go, so, wow, it's in print. It says this guy's a good artist. He must be a good artist. Well, you came up with an interesting product you mentioned to me about you also develop artists, like the Davo. Yeah, oh yeah. the Davo. Yeah, right. No one's ever heard of Leonard Davo. Yeah. He just seemed to fall off the map, and there's this <laughs> intact state in yeah. a dusty house yeah. somewhere. And, well, that's that's just the beginning. you got to educate the world that this Absolutely. is a collectible artist. Right. How do you do that? Well, we did an awful lot of research to start, and it turns out that although Dabo, he, he, when he, he died at the age of 94, I think, or maybe 95, and he'd been ill the last few years of his life, and he didn't show much the last decade of his life. He kept all his paintings, and he didn't share them with a dealer, and as a consequence, when he died, nobody knew where the guy lived. He had won all kinds of awards. He had had solo exhibition after solo. He had more solo exhibitions than pretty much any artist I know. When was this? Well, the solo exhibitions started in 1902, and his peak probably would have been in 14. And then he went off to fight the war, the, the First World War, and he came back and he started doing solo exhibits again, but 
He'd been gone for six years. So people were like, Leon who? Then he gets a better, better, and better deal. And he's in the south of France at the tail end of 39. And as you know, in, in the fall of 39, the Germans take Poland. He's in the south of France with his wife, who's Jewish. And he realizes, oh, this might come our way. And he packs up a truck, drives the truck and his wife to Paris. And he arrives there on the 12th. The Germans arrive on the 14th. And so he never gets out while well, there's free France. Then he takes about four months to actually get out. But in the meantime, it happened again. It's like, wow, you fought World War I, and people forgot who you are. Now you're in occupied France. What happened to you, pal? And so two, I think, fairly big blunders, neither of which he could avoid. He was a true patriot. He thought the atrocities of World War I were so egregious that he, he, he signed up, speaking seven languages, he enlisted when he was 52. And they brought him in as a second Louis and eventually left as a captain. And he was there the day, he was in the building when the armistice was signed. And so he's he's there, he's, he's essential to lots of things going on. It's a big part of the 4th Regiment. But he gave up his art career. And, and nobody, you know, six years later, is Leon Ho? <laughs> and so he got, ultimately he got forgotten. When he died, he left things to his wife, who was elderly at the time. When she died 14 years later, she left things to her sister, who was more elderly at the time. When she died, they, she left things to their brother, who was gay. And he had a different last name, who then left things to his mate in life, who had a different last name, who then found another mate when the younger mate died. And he left things to that guy. It was another different last It's impossible to find this. You, you couldn't have found the Davo estate with the best kind of detective work. They just called out of the blue one day and said, we have the estate of Leon Dabo. And I thought, there is no estate of Leon Dabo. What kind of hooey is this? And then we questioned them, and it sounded like maybe. And then Nathan and I got in a truck, got in a plane and flew to New York, and we went and saw it, and by God, the estate was there. So the first thing we did was research him enough to know that as unknown as he is, he's in a few museums that you know. He's in the Louvre, the most important museum on the planet. He's in the Musée d'Orsay, the great uh, Impressionist museum. He's in... The Met. You've heard of that. The Metropolitan Museum of New York. He's in the Frick. He's in the Smithsonian. He's in the Boston Club. I mean, he's in every, I think, 50 major museums in the United States, the most important museums in the United States. Not a single museum, by the way, on the West Coast. Uh, he, he was really an East Coaster. And so that's where we're finding the bulk of the market for him. As you mentioned market, because once mentioned to me a while ago, how you have to have people who want to collect paintings. You would do some packaging for museums. Could you describe mm -hmm. that for me? We're always working with museums for who are going to show artists that we have. And so they will ask us to pack things carefully and send them insured. And, and that, there's a little bit of finesse to that. We have a couple guys here who are really good at doing that kind of work. We are always sort of a little laggard in that area. But we're always working with museums to make sure that our artists, artists who's work is here, is shown when there's a show coming up, and most of the museums know us, and so they'll contact us to make sure that they, because they're looking for paintings, right? And we don't charge them for the paintings, they just borrow them and put them on the wall. And and that's certainly good for us. So we're, we, I would say we are always working with six or seven museums, constantly. How important is it for you as a businessman and a gallery uh, owner to own as many paintings of a particular artist as possible? Does it matter? It ultimately is, it, the difference between consigned and owned are, is really big in terms of financial commitment. There's no financial commitment to a consigned painting. And so, and there's also not as big a reward. If a consigned painter comes and says, you know, uh, I know this is worth a hundred grand, um, but I'd like you to sell it for me, or I'll bring it to auction. And the auctions are going to charge about 25% for a hundred thousand dollar painting. And so we look at them and we say, well, yes, it's worth 100 grand. We'll net you 75, and and we'll take that into inventory. We might, let's say, we bought 20 years ago. We bought a Lockwood de Forest for 500 dollars. Um, we can sell it for today for 20 thousand dollars, if we were smart enough to buy the Lockwood de Forest 20 years ago at 500 dollars. So there's much a, a much greater upside to owning than there is to consigning, but. We we would I would rather have those good paintings come here than go to an auction house, so we're we're happy to consign things. And auction houses are your competition, or they, they're big competition, huge competition today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
and that they're partially the economy is responsible for the loss of all those art galleries across the United States. But the other reason is that auction houses have become much more aggressive. It used to be they only wanted things that sold like in a million or two million or ten million bucks. Today they're perfectly, uh, Christie's and Sotheby's are perfectly happy to take, take things that are $20,000. Well, that's the sort of sweet spot in our inventory. Um, so we, all of a sudden we're faced with, you know, like, okay, I can buy this from the auction house for 20 grand or I can buy it today from you, but you got to do better than 20. So we, yeah. we make an accommodation it, if we can and move on. You win some, you lose some. Yeah, but we can't, like if somebody comes in and the piece that they're looking at is consigned, and they say, well, we want 25% off, we have to say that, I mean, sorry, I don't own it, and I owe 25% when I sell it, <laughs> and I agreed not to sell it for less than 75000 so you have to do better than that. Usually there's a way to find a middle, but it's very interesting. There's so little money in consigned pieces that you really, we have to be very careful. So you really do favor owning the painting if it's the yes. right price. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's easier with that many pieces of art, keeping track of, there are probably three or 400 pieces here that belong to somebody else. You have to keep track of those. You have to insure those. You have to yeah, you inventory them. them. Yeah. We don't own them. They're the most well, sort of special things here in some con ways. Conversely, it's a very almost dumb question. Maybe it is. You'll have to tell me. How many paintings do you own? And where are they located? We own about 2,000 painting paintings. Yeah. They're here and they're on site. There are warehouses on site. Mm -hmm. um, our attic cavities, you could walk up there. Yeah. And there's thousands of paintings up there. Yeah. We maybe own 2,500 works on paper. Mm -hmm. And and so a work on paper, you know what a stack of 500 sheets of paper look like. Yeah, it's not right. very big. Yeah. So we can keep those as long as they're not framed in a relatively small space. But paintings are almost always framed. And so for us to hold 2,000 plus the 500 that are consigned, 2,500 paintings means that our inventory system has to be flawless. And there are every once in a while accidents that happen. You know, develop a leak in a roof and it leaks into a room where there's paintings. Oh. Like, oh my God, you know, then we're, you know, we're, the whistle blows and we, we're all of a sudden all hands are on deck and trying to figure out what's going on. We rent the building that, that you and I are in right now. And the landlord thought it was okay to use our hallway to do some pre-construction. He asked me, can I use that hallway? And I said, sure, but we need to be there. He didn't need to hear the we need to be there part. And so all of a sudden there was a crew of five or six contractors in a space where we're secured. And we then had to do an inventory that probably cost us four grand to make sure that nothing had been stolen because we didn't know what had happened when we weren't there. And ultimately they hadn't taken anything and everything was secure and everything was where it should have been. But the thought of having people who are not trained in art and may or may not be honest, we just didn't know. And so that was all hands on deck. You also, you mentioned you were teaching in your earlier mm -hmm. life. You're an engineer. Yep. Now what were you engineering? Environmental engineering. Environmental engineering. So you have the discipline and all right. that to do oh, yeah. that. Yeah. The appreciation for art, restauranting, yeah. packaging. It's a lot. And then you do gallery openings, which are creative oh, yeah. affairs too. Yeah. Is there anything that you still would like to do that you haven't done? Um, I would really like to be more involved in writing than I am. I mean, you know, you have the creative urge. And I'm always, if I'm awake at nine and my wife goes to sleep or wants to watch television, I don't like television, and I'll, I'll go and sit at a computer and start my research at some part. And I love writing about really good artists about whom there's little known. I mean, I'm looking at the catalog from the Golden Gate International Exhibition in 1939, and I see all these artists with reproductions in there who I know. I mean, there were 600 American artists in there, and I probably know 350 of them. The other 250, I don't know. And I found a painting by a young woman, very young woman at the time, whose name is Mary Combs, and the painting was of a woman who was sort of splayed, seated in a chair, very attractive woman who just looked like she was ready to pull her hair out with the difficulties of life. It was such a powerful painting that I thought, well, I'm going to do a little research and see who she is. And I haven't been able to find out a thing about her. So now all of a sudden I want to know, who's Mary Combs? Yeah. I'll say like a dog on a tear now. Oh boy, I'll say. And, I, and, and there is at least one reproduction in that exhibit was, there has been no exhibit in your and my lifetime on the West Coast equivalent to that. That was the last really great international exhibit that was on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we haven't had any. Seattle had the World's Fair, but they didn't do a big art thing. And that's now a long time ago. That's probably 40 years ago. Maybe, no, 50 years ago. Was that 68, I think? 
Uh, there is a lot to be written, and the writing task is much easier today than it ever has been. Oh, computers. And, well, yeah. and because you can read Century Magazine, which yeah. has a lot of old stories about artists in it, you had to go sit with the Reader's Guide to Periodicals, try and find the era that the publication was in, then sit down and read the damn thing from cover to cover, a, a month magazine with 125 pages. It was just exhaustive. Today, all that's viewable online and searchable by word. And so what would have taken more than a lifetime, you could write, a if you had nothing else to do, you could write a really authoritative book about a gifted and famous artist who, about whom nothing is written in a year, whereas before two lifetimes, you'd have to have a team of people working. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I very much thank you for taking your time to be with us, Frank. You're welcome. If you want to contact Frank, you have to go to the website for It's So Interesting and there's the information. Good. Well, thank you, George. It's a pleasure. Uh, my friendship with you uh, will go on for many years. So interesting. It's so interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. interesting. It's interesting.